Hello, my name's Gideon Cordova and this is my two cents adjusted for inflation. Today I'd like to talk to you about framing. Framing as in cognition, not framing as in construction. Framing in cognition is all about language and linguistics and words. How words make you think and how words make you feel. Because words are really funny, aren't they? I mean funny ha ha, not funny peculiar. Funny ha ha is a good thing, whereas funny peculiar could be a bad thing. Would you like to have more or less? More is good, less is bad. Unless, of course, we're talking about a bad thing, in which case more is bad and less is good. Should I go into more debt? debt? More debt is bad and less debt is good. Unless it's good debt, in which case more good debt is good and less good debt is bad. Credit is good and debt is bad. But if you spend too much on your credit card, that's bad because it puts you more into debt. Whereas spending on your debit card is good because that just depletes your savings, which are good. But if we all save too much, then that means nobody will be spending, which is bad for business. I've been told that a deficit is bad and a surplus is good. A surplus is having more of something than you need. It's having an excess supply of a thing. I just read that we have 730,000 Australian children living in poverty. More than 2.3 million Australians living in poverty. Well, that's more than we could ever need. Therefore, we have a surplus of poverty and a surplus of homelessness, which is good, right? Wrong. In Australia, we have more than 100,000 people sleeping rough, homeless, every night. More than 100,000. That's more than you could poke a stick at. It's more than we could ever possibly need. It is an excess supply of homeless people. It's so many, in fact, that if you took all of the homeless Australians, put them in one spot at the one time, and then gave them a house between four people each, that would be a city the size of Bendigo. We could call it Australia's great homeless city. Of course, having given them all houses, they wouldn't then be homeless, so we'd have to think of a different name. Bendigo 2 or New Bendigo. Did you know that Australia has a positive trade deficit? Now, what am I supposed to think about that? A positive trade deficit. Is that a good thing or is it a bad thing? Do I like it or do I dislike it? Well, if Japan sends us a thousand cars in a year, we only send them a thousand cars in a year. Australia's trade relationship with Japan is in balance. If Japan sends us a thousand cars in a year, we only send them 900 cars back we have a positive trade deficit with Japan. They're not going to give us those 100 cars for free. We're going to have to pay for them. We'll pay for them in Australian dollars. Each car costs $10,000. So now, 100 cars, we have a $1 million trade deficit with Japan. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Well, if in 30 years, Australian dollars, little shiny bits of paper with the Queen's head on them, if they're devalued, if the currency goes down to nil, at least we've got the cars. What would you rather have? The real goods and services? or the bits of paper with the Queen's head on them. In fact, only 3% of the currency is actual paper. 97% of the currency is digital dollars. It's your, on your uh, online banking account. It's those numbers. How do you put numbers into a spreadsheet? Have you ever typed into a spreadsheet before? It's not that difficult. One, zero, 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 zero. That's how we issue money. That's not we, not you and I. You and I are the users of the currency, but that's how the government issues the money nowadays. They're not hammering gold into the computer. They're not dropping cash into a bucket every time Centrelink pays your welfare payments. They just type that money in with computer keystrokes. Now, is that scary? It, I don't know. I don't know whether it's scary or not. It's just how it is. In 1971, we went off the gold standard. Well, 1971, Bretton Woods Agreement ended. Nixon took America off the gold standard. It used to be between 1946, when they signed the Bretton Woods Agreement, and 1971, for that period of time, the 40-something countries that were in the Bretton Woods Agreement all agreed to keep their currencies convertible into the US dollar, which could then be traded in for 35 US dollars per ounce of gold. And if you tried to issue more money than you had in gold reserves to back it up, well, that would devalue the currency. But now, we're on a fiat currency. A fiat currency. There's no convertibility. They can issue as many of them as they want. It might create inflation. It might create all kinds of consequences. But operationally, they are not constrained. They can never go insolvent with respect to liabilities that are denominated in their own currency. That's the power of fiat. And that's the system in which we live. Real resources are constrained. There's only a certain number of trees. There's only a certain amount of the environment that we can use up for our own purposes. There's only a certain number of people on the planet that we can enact their productivity. 
but there is an unlimited supply of fiat currency. We can never run out of that. So next time they say, how are we going to afford it? Ask yourself the question, do we have the real resources available to afford it? If yes, then yes, that's how we're going to afford it. We're just going to issue more money to make the thing happen. Right now in Australia, with 1.8 million people who either are unemployed or not working as many hours as they want to be working, doing the thing that they want to be doing, we are massively underutilizing our productive capacity. That means that there are real resources sitting on the shelf. And there are plenty of industries that don't require the destruction of the environment in order to create productivity. How many mobile phone apps can you create without destroying the environment? How many pieces of music on the piano can you compose without destroying the environment? How many national parks can you regenerate and rejuvenate? How many environmental projects can you do without destroying the planet? A lot. A lot. How many elderly people can you sit with, engaging with, playing checkers with on a weekend or every day of the week? How many young people can you help educate without destroying the environment? There's plenty of work to be done and plenty of unutilized people who are putting their hand up, screaming, asking, can I please have some work? No, I don't want to have to travel an hour and a half to go flip burgers in the CBD. I want to be doing something for my local community where I travel five minutes down the road and give singing lessons or teach people about birds. That's what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a federally funded but locally administered job guarantee where all of those people who are currently being underutilized, who want more income than they currently have and want to be working more than they're currently working, I'm talking about giving them the opportunity to work. The whole conversation about framing is very important, which is why I encourage you to digest George Lakoff's work. We are told that the government is living beyond its means, but we're never asked to question what those means really are. The Australian government is the monopoly issuer of the Australian dollar. They can't run out of it. They can issue just as much of it as they so please. So Australia's means are not fiscally constricted, they're real resource constricted. Do we have the real resources to implement the policy that we want? Either yes or no, but that should be the frame of the debate. Whether or not we can afford it, whether or not it's our within our means, has nothing to do with Australian dollars. They're an infinite supply. All it has to do with is the real resources that are out there. And therein lies the rub. In a supermarket, there's food on the shelf. And if somebody doesn't pay for it in Australian dollars and the food then goes rancid, they'll throw the food out. But Australian dollars are infinite. There's never a shortage of them. Whereas in order to create that food, that required real resources in its manufacture. It required real land, real labor, real time and effort and real materials. Whereas the Australian dollar, on the other hand, is simply issued by the Reserve Bank of Australia. It is as easy to print more Australian dollars as it is to type zeros into a computer keyboard. So why is it that we spend all this time in Australia worrying about how we're going to afford it and where's the money going to come from when money is infinite, whereas real resources are not? The way that we talk about money makes us feel a certain way about the money. So I've been told that Australia has a debt mountain. A mountain. A mountain is like a large, insurmountable, enormous, big thing sounds difficult and challenging to get over a mountain. You would want to go around a mountain, you wouldn't want to just walk straight over it. it. It sounds exhausting, it sounds difficult. Whereas if you punch zeros into a computer keyboard, you wouldn't say that there's a mountain of numbers in front of you. It feels less scary to just look at zeros on a keyboard. Whereas if we say that there's a debt mountain, we've got a billion dollars of debt, it makes you feel a certain way about it. It makes you feel like it's bad. It's not really bad at all. It doesn't really matter. And in fact, because a government surplus is necessarily a non-government deficit, it's the opposite. The more debt that the government gets into, the better off that the non-government sector is because the government is spending its money and then that money has to go somewhere. It doesn't just evaporate, the money goes somewhere. It either goes to the foreign sector, but a lot of it goes to the non-government sector. And the non-government sector is the private businesses and households like you and me. So we want the government to deficit spend because it can bring new net financial assets into the economy. 
The alternative to that is simply getting money from a bank. Well, I take out a $100,000 loan from a bank and ultimately I have to pay it off. So there is a corresponding liability. Every time I get money from a bank, there's a corresponding liability to pay it off. So ultimately, in the long run, it nets to zero. Whereas when the government pays a welfare check, for example, the recipient never has to pay that money back. There's no corresponding liability on that money. When the government builds a road, it spends $100 million to build this highway, and nobody ever has to pay that $100 million back. That is the creation of new net financial assets. I wanted to start talking about framing. It kind of got into my head because of the trying to remember the distinction between normative economics and positive economics. So normative economics is the discussion of economics with a value judgment on it. It's talking about the way things ought to be. That's normative economics, and that's as distinct from positive economics. Positive economics is a discussion simply about what is. It doesn't put a value judgment on policy prescriptions. It just describes what is in the economy. That's positive economics. And I found that hard to remember because normative, the word normative, comes from the same place as the word normal. It just means standard. It comes from that Latin word norma, which referred to a carpenter's square. Well, to me, there was nothing normal about putting a value judgment on something and saying, here's how things should be. That doesn't sound normal to me. It sounds positive, but it doesn't sound normal. Whereas positive economics is all about how things are in the status quo. It just describes what is. And to me, that doesn't seem very positive. But then again, language is silly like that. You know, the liberals are conservative, unless you're a liberal in America, in which case you're not. And labor is socialist except in Australia where labor isn't socialist and socialists are pro-labor except in France where they're liberal and I mean liberal in an Australian sense not in an American sense and conservatives are conservative except when it comes to conserving the environment then they don't want to have anything to do with it leave that job to the conservationists and Republicans are Republican Republicans believe in a user pay system pay per use pay for your own education pay for your own health care if you can't afford it you don't get it you pay for it and if you're rich you get it and if you're poor you don't get it except when it comes to the military when you can spend as much as you want on that and whether you make zero US dollars per year or 10 million a year the US army will defend you irrespective. So that's a bit socialist isn't it? What are you gonna do right? So I wanted to finish by talking about the importance of understanding sectoral balances. This is the notion that a government surplus is a non-government deficit and vice versa. And there's the link to framing. If every time they say on the news, there's a government deficit and it's increasing, you need to start saying to yourself, oh, so you're saying that there's more new net financial assets in the economy? Oh, the deficit for the government is increasing. I'm not the government. I'm the private sector. I'm the non-government. Every time the government deficit goes up, the non-government surplus goes up. What would you rather have? Who do you want to be? You can be uh, the, the government and I'll be the private sector. You spend $100 and you only take back 90 in taxes. Are you the government or am I the government? I'll be the government. I'll be the bad guy. Happy to be the bad guy. You're the non-government. You're the private sector. You're some households and some businesses and I'm the government. I spend $100 and I'm going to take back 90 of those dollars in taxes. Give them back. Okay, so I've now got my $90. But I issued 100 originally, so now I'm $10 short. That's my deficit. You've got it. That's your surplus. The government deficit is your surplus. It's the non-government surplus. We like surpluses because the non-government sector likes to save money. It likes to save it for a rainy day. It needs to save it for a rainy day when you think about it because it just can't issue more. Whereas a government saving is ridiculous. If they issue their own currency, what do they need to save it for? I struggle to explain that better than just saying, think about it. <laughs> think about it. The government issues the money. They can issue more whenever they want. And that they can issue as much of it as they want. I'm not saying they should, I'm just saying that they can. They can issue as much as they want. So why would they need to save it? They can just issue more of it. Words are used to manipulate often. And that's why framing is important. You need to understand when they say the government deficit is going up, 
you need to remember that that's your surplus going up. So obviously, do you want more or do you want less? Is this good for me or is this bad for me? The higher the government deficit, so too the higher the non-government surplus. Somebody's surplus is somebody's deficit. Somebody's income is somebody's spending. Somebody's spending turns into somebody's income. It's an accounting identity. Make sure you look up Win Godley's sectoral balances and you will see here's a chart. Win Godley developed this chart and it shows the mirror image. Somebody's spending is somebody's income. Our country's trade deficit is somebody else somebody else's country's trade surplus. It has to be that way. It's an accounting identity. The money doesn't disappear, it goes somewhere. So when the government spends it, it goes somewhere. Do you want the government to spend less? That means you have less. If the government spends more, it's their debt, but you're not them. You're you. Remember who you are. You're you, not them. They spend money, you get money. If they save money, that means you don't get it. Do you want it? Do you not want it? They are the issuer of the currency. They can issue as much of it as they ever want to. You can't. You're a household. You have to use their money. You're a user of the currency. They're the issuer of the currency. User, issuer. User, issuer. Very important. Taxes don't fund spending. Very important. I was on the train in the public transport system, Melbourne or Sydney or any of the big cities in the world. Here in Tasmania, we don't really have a public transport system, but... In these big cities, you take your ticket and you put it in the machine and it swallows the ticket. You had to get the ticket first before you could put it into the machine, right? You didn't print your own ticket at home. That wouldn't work in the machine. The machine only accepts official tickets with the official barcode on them. Where do you think the train company gets the tickets from? Do they have to wait until I spend my ticket into the machine before that they can collect it from the machine and take it to the front where somebody else will then buy it to put it in the machine? Where did the initial ticket come from? You have to be issued the ticket before you can put it into the machine. What am I trying to say? Taxes don't fund spending. They had to issue you currency before they could take some of it back in taxes. So you might ask me, why are you even talking about this, Gideon? What's the point? In Australia, we have one of the highest standards of living in the world. And I say, yes, indeed, we do. And 100 years ago, Australia had the highest salaries per capita, the highest wages of anyone in the world. Did we stop there? Did we say, OK, that's enough? Or did we continually improve the nation? Just because we're doing great now doesn't mean that we can't eliminate the poverty. Doesn't mean we can't eliminate the homelessness. We can always do better. We always should do better. And that's the same for the rest of the world as well. Do you think it's possible for all the people in Cambodia to live with the same standard of living as the people in Singapore without the entire earth bursting into flames? I think it's possible. And I think that's the same for Africa. I think that people in Africa should have the same standard of living as we do here in Sydney. Could we manage to achieve that without the entire earth bursting into flames? I think we could. Somebody from Africa once said, having been, once said to me, having been born in Africa, having lived in Africa, grew up in Africa and worked in Africa, I know that it's impossible. And I said, yeah, it might be impossible. My elderly relatives told me the same story about when they were living in Europe in 1550. They said, hey, look around you, it's Europe. This is the Dark Ages. Look at the institutions, look at the corruption, look at the people. They could never possibly get any better than this, the Dark Ages. It's impossible. And sure enough, it was impossible for as long as people believed it was impossible. And then when a group of people came around who thought that it was possible, it became possible. And sure enough, we left the Dark Ages of Europe. And in 1969, when we went to the moon, we did it not because it was easy, but because it was hard. And we achieved it, not because it was impossible, but because we believed that it was possible. My name's Gideon Cordova. Thank you so much for joining me. This has been my two cents adjusted for inflation. I'll catch you next time.